and gentlemen, it's time for the Schmodown Rundown. Introducing first, Frankie Stats Janish. And your host, the man of controversy, Mr. Brian David. Let's get ready to Schmodown. What's going on, Movie Trivia Schmodown fans? It is episode number 61 of the Schmodown Rundown, the official after show for the Movie Trivia Schmodown. My name is Brian Davids, and I'll be your host for this week. As always, I'm joined by Francois Integer, the stat lord himself, Frank Janish. What's going on, man? Well, that's a, that's a new line of uh, introduction there, the Francois stuff. That's pretty good. I'm doing pretty good, though. I'm doing good. It's a new era for the show. Got to do a new nickname. It's only fitting. So now I know the audience was expecting an announcement this week, and that announcement was supposed to introduce a potential new co-host. But after some discussion with Christian, we decided that it's best to have me lead the show since people say that I don't talk enough on most shows as it is, and they also say it'd be a shame for for me to waste such a natural hosting voice. So I'm thrilled that I get to carry on the rundown's righteous legacy. So tonight we're going to talk a little news, as well as all the inner geekdom week goodness your hearts could handle. Frank, am I missing anything? Uh, yeah, I th- I think your miscommunication happened sometime last week because there was a memo that I don't think you probably read or got, maybe. You might want to double check your messages. Uh, let me see here. Oh, so I didn't get Rutger Hauer's memo, but it turns out we do have a new co-host. You know him a bit already. He's Booker T's right-hand man. He hosts various shows and podcasts, including a Biff-centric Back to the Future podcast. Unfortunately, he has no relation to anyone named Lorelai or Rory, but that's okay because he's the Rundown's new co-host, as well as the first voice you'll hear each week. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Brad Gilmore. Hey, what's going on, guys? Schmodown fans, Schmoville Collider fans, it is I, Brad Gilmore. I'm so excited to be a part of the Schmodown Rundown. And uh, you know what? Aaron Turner, I want to say this, Aaron Turner did a phenomenal job. He was an incredible host. Uh, you know, he started this thing, got it to the level it did. And um, I'm just, you know, pr- it's a privilege that uh, y'all are welcoming into your family. And uh, I will continue the legacy that is Aaron Turner. And Mr. Harloff, thanks for the opportunity. I'm ready to talk some Schmodown, guys. I'm excited. Let's do it. Can you believe that a DM about five weeks ago and two appearances later has now <laughs> led to you being the very host of the show? You know, uh, life is a funny thing, isn't it? Uh, you know what's funny is I, I listened to this show um, already as a fan. I enjoyed listening to it. And I just reached out. Remember, I just reached out and said, hey, guys, if you ever want somebody on, you know, give me a shout. I'd love to talk Schmodown with you. And, and then next thing you know, next thing you know. But, you know, like I said, Aaron <laughs> did such a great job. And I think he's going to be so missed. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to do the same job that he did. I'm going to bring I'm going to try to bring something different to the show. And uh, and I hope the Schmodown fans out there will accept me. I think the lesson here is, folks, take initiative. You never know what might happen. The one thing I do know, you'll be doing less jumping than Mr. Aaron Turner. We'll see what kind of verb you like to use, but the jumping will be few and far between, I think. So let's <laughs> jump to the first match of the week. The inner geekdom match, the qualifier match between Miss Emma Fife and Mr. Jason Inman. Now, we had something very special to start off this match as we had what I call Thad Fabe, where this was basically the commissioner update to begin the episode. We've never really seen this before. So Thad, as the interim commissioner, is really making himself at home. He said that the contracts are done. He reported a lot of the matches that we touched on last week, including November 28th's Only Stupid Answers versus the Wildberries. On December 1st, though, there's a new match that I'm 
very interested in as a team entitled Top That faces off against DC Movie News. And who might top that be? Of course, that is the team formerly known as IGN, a team that I was a big fan of. I thought they were a future contender for sure. Personally, I hate the team name, Top That, just because it's going to be rather confusing considering Top 10 is a thing still. Perhaps T10 should actually go with the Bottom 10 moniker just to avoid confusion. However, I still think Team Clammy Hands would have been the best play for IGN given that that was their most infamous moment, a moment that could have drastically changed the team landscape long before the team tournament. So, Frank, let me get your reaction to Team Top That and their match against DC Movie News on December 1st. First of all, the name is very interesting. Uh, you're right. Top That and Top 10, very, very similar. They have, you know, the same first word of their team. So that might be a little confusing at first. As far as the match, DC Movie News, you know, they've really proven themselves, Mike and Adam, in different matches and in, in different scenarios. So to go up against a team with Jim and uh, Eric Goldman, I was going to say Gilmore, but we have – Brad Gilmore here. It's going to be interesting to see how they come back for their first time in quite some time. I hope, at least, they've been playing along at home just to kind of uh, keep pace with the league and everything that's going on. I suspect that they probably are doing a lot of homework in between, hopefully, so that we get a great match against DC Movie News. I'm looking forward to it because I think Mike Kalinowski has a newfound confidence going through the tournaments um, and knowing just how good he can be. And I know Jim Vavita... Uh, every time I tweet out a stat, you know, he seems to like it, and uh, I think he's pretty confident in his abilities as well. It's going to be a very, very interesting matchup when the time comes. Before I get to you, Brad, I want to close out Thad Fabe as he also went on to announce Lon Harris versus Mark Bernardin and uh, reiterated the Star Wars five-way match that will uh, decide the contender against Knapsack at Spectacular. So, Brad Gilmore, let me get your take on the overall Thad Fabe package that started off this episode well you know i actually think thad's doing a great job as the interim commissioner uh it seems like you know he doesn't want to let you know let that job go but we'll see where that plays out now as far as team top that and the comparison to top 10 and yeah and, and thad yeah as far as that goes that doesn't bother me so much you know if you talk about peak wwf you had steve austin steve williams and steve blackman all in the company at the same time so i mean the name really doesn't do much for you but ign is it, it is interesting that they're going to come back, even though reformed in a new name. But, I mean, I don't think we've seen them since the summer, right? I mean, the team league. We haven't seen them in quite a while. And so I'm with you, Frank. I hope they win. They studied because DC Movie News, you know, Kalinowski. Kalinowski, a lot of guys picked to go on all the way in the Ultimate Showdown. So I think DC Movie News, who also uh, we will probably see some – you know, promotional work there by the great Johnny LaQuasto. I think that they have a really good shot uh, coming back into the regular season of the Schmodown. I think DC Movie News, by this time next year, will be holding those tag team championships. IGN's last match was when they TKO'd Thad's Deep Cuts team. So that was the middle of summer. That was July 25th. But then there was that shocking news to where Goldman got hired by Marvel and IGN subsequently had to pull out of the team tourney, and that's what allowed Deep Cuts to enter the tournament at the last minute. So strange things are afoot within the Schmodown. I still think it would be an unbelievable storyline if David Griffin replaced Eric Goldman as the second member of the team formerly known as IGN to get his revenge against Collider in the Schmodown because they never utilized him besides free-for-all within the Schmodown. So if David Griffin comes out as Vavita's partner, that would just blow my mind. I don't know about oh, you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would, bl- that would yeah, definitely blow my mind. That would be something that I would never have guessed to happen. It does seem like Thad is really settling into this role as interim commissioner, and a lot of us are speculating, as was Brad a moment ago, that he's not going to let go of this position. He, it seems like Harloff is going to have a big problem when it comes time to take the the role back. So I love what they're doing with Thad. All right, let's get on to the actual match itself. We had Ken, Mark Ellis, and the android, Mark and Draco, at the desk this time around. So 
What was interesting about this was Android, kind of right off the bat, walked back his Emma 5 criticism and mentioned how she got under his skin recently. He apologized for going after her her fashion sense. So I, I wonder how Heather Grace Hancock of the Lion's Den, a fellow stablemate of Mark and Draco, will feel about this. Frank, what was your reaction to not only Android at the desk, but how he apologized to Heather Grace Hancock's arch enemy of Emma Fife? Yeah, I was pretty surprised to see Draco at the table right off the bat, but I was uh, curious to see what he would bring, so I was all for it. And as far as him walking back his words to Emma Fife. Uh, not a very Lion Denny thing to do. Not something Grace would be a fan of, I would imagine, as most people would. So it was interesting that he walked it back in the way that he did. I think you could have walked it back, but not have been so nice about it. I felt he was almost too nice, and I think that's where he might run into trouble later on with his fellow stablemates. Maybe we'll see something uh, in regards to that down the line. Brad Gilmore, do you think Heather Grace Hancock is going to throw a fit over Mark and Draco's apology to Emma Fife? You know, his apology was a little bit out of character for the android, but, you know, he here's the thing. He was put in a position to call the match, and I think that he, at the at the beginning of the match, wanted to make sure that everyone knew that he was going to be impartial and that he was not going to hold a grudge against one MO5 for, quote-unquote, getting under his skin. So I think he wanted to address any concerns right off the top, give the apology, extend the olive branch, at least for this one occasion, and let everybody know it was going to be a straight-down-the-middle match. Uh, and Draco, though, at the table, I did like, because Mark and Draco still has my moment of the year in the schmodown when it came to the free for all. And I think I, we all know what moment I'm talking about. So I liked having Andrako at the table. I think he fit the inner geekdom format. And as far as, you know, the apology to Emma Fife goes, like I said, I think he just wanted to clear the air and focus on the match. Brad, you're absolutely right. Because when you are sitting at that table, when you are sitting at that desk, you do have to approach it as a neutral commentator. You cannot be characters for the most part. Of, of course, Dagnino, uh, gets some exceptions because it's Dagnino, but for the most part, uh, you've got to approach the table differently. And so I'm glad to see that he did that. I'm just not sure how Heather Grace Hancock is going to react to it. So, and, and besides that wonderful moment at, at Free For All, we cannot forget about Android with what is still probably the rant of the year at Collision after the Snyder Harloff match. So, this guy, when you use him, he's. He's essentially gold, so I like that he's got a little bit of an expanded role. A lot of people have been saying for a while that they don't use Android enough, so hopefully this is a sign of things to come, that uh, he'll be at the table more, so we shall see. But let's get the promos. Jason Emmon was itching for inner geekdom, something he's been saying for a while. Emma Fife, she said that she vowed to listen to the questions in full this time. This cost her in the famous Puddin' match not too long ago. And uh, guys, any thoughts from the promos? Let me start with you, Brad. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is uh, the one thing that stuck out to me. I love Jason Inman's promo. I thought it was strong. You know, you could tell he was full of confidence. Did anyone pick up on the point where he actually compared Emma Fife to Adolf Hitler? Did anyone else pick up on that because when he no. was comparing himself? <laughs> no, he, he was saying... You know, everyone has their arch enemy. You know, I can't remember him exactly, but it was like, you know, it ended up with saying Indiana Jones has Hitler. Oh, right, you know, right. <laughs> in, in reference to saying, you know, Emma Fife is, you know, my, my challenger tonight, my opponent tonight. And I was like, did he really just compare Emma Fife to Hitler? I think he did. I think he did that. But um, <laughs> as far as the ma uh, the promos go, uh, Inman uh, won the promo match. I think uh, Fife still used to, you know, being the one to, you know, direct the traffic and not cause the collision, if you will. And so she's got to, um, you know, bring out that um inner fire in her promos to really convey that she and, and convey and convince to the audience that she will be the superior competitor. Now I love when Aaron Wilhelm, I love when Thad and all the post-production guys, I love when they get crazy with the VFX. Inman came out, he got a little uh, Doctor Who action, whatever you want to call it. He got a little visual effect on the screen. Uh, Emma, of course, got a great intro when it came to her wand that she brought out. This was some 
Harry Potter nonsense. I'm not a not a big fan of the Harry Potter, as you guys know, but uh, I love when they use visual effects. Frank, what were your thoughts on the entrances? Yeah, they were very simple, but with the addition of the visual effects for both players, I thought they were pretty good entrances, uh, considering they just walked out, pointed at the camera. I, I enjoyed them for as short and as uh, small as they were. Now, Brad Gilmore, I'm sure you're a huge Doctor Who fan. Did Jason Inman's entrance do a lot for you? You know, surprisingly enough, I haven't gotten like heavy into Doctor Who yet, but I know I will eventually. But uh, as far as Jason Inman goes, yeah, I mean, I love the little visual effects. You know, when I was a kid and, you know, you watch, um, you know, pro wrestling, obviously it's all about the entrance. And uh, I was always a sucker for the uh, for the pyro or if any screen effect came on for their entrances. So I definitely Jason Inman won me over with that one as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I like I like the Doctor Who-ness of one Jason Inman. Brad Gilmore loves lasers and fire, folks. Write I that do. down as we get to know our new co-host. So Walt's a scientist. Scientists love lasers. Let's get to round one. At the end of round one, it was eight to six, Jason Inman. Frank, let me get your take on the round first. Yeah, Jason pretty much did what I thought he would do. In fact, a little stronger than I thought he would do. In fact, uh, eight points out of ten. Uh, it's very, very solid. He's been really good in these opening rounds uh, in the inner geek tome. As for Emma, I was hoping she could build off uh, a disappointing loss, knowing that she really had a shot to go all the way in her five-way. Uh, so I thought she would have the confidence to do well in the first round. And for the most part, she did. She faltered here and there. But she finished somewhat strong, even though she missed that V for Vendetta question at the end, which I really can't blame her. I'm not huge on V for Vendetta, so I can give a pass on that one personally. Brad? It was good. I mean, there were a lot of questions there that I thought were kind of softballs, like Harry Potter's dad's first name. I think everyone pretty much knows that's James. The one that they both missed Not me. that irritated me was they missed what was Spider-Man's you know, original name uh, when he was going into the wrestling match. What do you want to be called? And you know, I'm like, how do y'all not remember it was the human spider? And I can tell you who his opponent was. It was the bone saw portrayed by Macho Man Randy Savage. These are the things that we need to remember, people. And I don't know, I don't know how. And Jason Inman points on saying Bruce Campbell was the one who gave him the name. Bruce Campbell obviously having those three cameos in the Raimi Spider-Man films. But you got to remember the human spider. To go back to that Harry Potter thing, I thought at first – when uh, Emma Fife answered the Harry Potter question correctly, the very first question of the match, I thought this was good for her because we saw that she struggled a little bit, even though Harry Potter is a, str a strong suit of hers. She struggled a little bit in her last match when it came to the Harry Potter question because she just she just answered too fast. She didn't listen. You could tell that the bright lights got to her a little bit. And so I thought that this would set her up if she were to spin that category or get a um, another Harry Potter in the round three, that this would you know kind of ease her nerves and, and get her ready to answer those questions more efficiently. And we see what happens later on. But as far as the first round goes, I thought it was still anybody's ball game uh, when we're going into round two. Brad, remind me to tell you my infamous story of when I took Tobey Maguire all in at the Mirage Poker Room. I've told it on several <laughs> shows already. So uh, since you appear to be a fan of the Maguire Spider-Man films, I'm sure this will be of great interest to you. Brian, with great power comes great responsibility. Just remember that. As well as, well as $1,500 cash in my pocket, but that's a story for another time. Now, I have a few things to add here. First off, another universal miss to start off the match. It was question two, the Peter Parker question, as Brad talked about. But I don't know why this is always the case, or almost always the case. These universal misses typically happen in question one or question two it's the craziest damn thing that i i just i don't have an answer for but a uh, question four question four i found very interesting the carbonite question what substance can sustain a person in perfect hibernation if you just heard or read the question you'd have no idea what franchise or genre they were referring to i don't always pay attention to the category announcement because usually the questions are self-referential enough to 
clue me into what category is being asked, but I'm not sure if Inman heard the category either since he had to ask for a repeat rule. He certainly knew the answer given his rushed answer that was ultimately misspelled, but imagine if the James Potter question was written as, what is the name of the titular character's father? That requires you to listen to the category without fail when most questions have some sort of reference point. So regardless of the category being read, do you guys think the question should make a point to reference the subject, especially since the players can't see what we see? I'm a big fan of the questions getting, and especially the wording, getting tougher as the match goes on. So I can see your point here. Uh, if you just read the question, didn't know the category, uh, I can get on board with that argument because it is the first round. It should be pretty straightforward as long as you have something in the question that makes it, uh, I guess, a level one question, if you will. I can see that. I didn't really quite have a problem with the question at first because I did hear the category. And so when I saw you know, the question, I, I immediately knew this answer. Um, but yeah, it was very interesting, even with Jason's repeat, that uh, he had a hard time spelling or even remembering the, the answer fully. See, I don't mind questions getting more difficult as the match goes along, but that doesn't mean the wording has to become more confusing or complex. One day when the players can see the questions on a screen, then I'm all for it, but question difficulty does not require a question to be longer or convoluted. If that's going to happen in the current format, at least let them have their whiteboards the entire match as a notation device, something I've mentioned in the past. Brad, what's your take on all this? I agree with you, Brian. I don't know what category it's from. If I were to snooze on the category, um, I would completely be lost. Now, I did, like Frank, I heard them say Star Wars, and as soon as I read what it said, I knew exactly what the answer was. Um, But I think, though, in the question, it, it should say, you know, what substance, you know, in the Star Wars galaxy is known to sustain a person in perfect hibernation or something like that. Um, because you're right, this is kind of a fish out of water question. Stuff like that happens. And I think that gives you even more incentive to make sure you listen to the category and, and make sure you know exactly what the question is referring to, even if you know a character or a movie title isn't referenced in said question. Interesting discussion nonetheless. I'm glad that you guys entertained that. Beyond that, I still felt that Android was adjusting to the role as announcer in this round. Of course, it's his first round. He's going to have an adjustment period. There's potential there. So I I appreciate that this was still a competitive round, though, overall. If you're Emma, you've got to be feeling pretty good at this point, even though the losing team at the end of round one only wins 17% of the time. That's a stat that... Uh, Frank and I discussed last week. So uh, even though she was down two points, eight to six, you know you're in this match. She's probably got some confidence going into round two. It's anyone's match at this point. The wheel obviously will decide otherwise. But uh, I like that round one was close because if round one is close, usually the rest of the match is going to be pretty good. Usually. So let's get to round two. Emma Fife spun Marvel movies. And then she spun again for... Star Wars, which is a good thing because she's a big Star Wars fan. She hosts some Star Wars stuff on other channels. So this was definitely a favorable spin for Emma. She ended her turn with three points as two points were stolen by Jason Justice Inman. Frank, let me get your take on Emma Fife's turn. So just before I get into Emma's round here, I I feel like I need to say this about her performance in the second round, given that we all know she's a big Star Wars fan. I just want to say to everyone out there, just because you can't answer trivia questions about one of your favorite franchises, your pro- a property, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, what have you, does not invalidate your your fandom or your your geekiness you know, towards Star Wars. So I just, I just want to make sure everyone understands that this doesn't have any effect on saying, you know, She's not as big a Star Wars fan as we thought she was. I She is a huge Star Wars fan. If you follow her work, you understand that she is. And just because uh, she didn't get all the questions you would have gotten right doesn't make her any less of a fan. But I saw some early comments as a poser type 
So uh, I don't buy any of that. I still think she's a huge uh, fan of Star Wars and of all geek culture. So I just want to put that out there. Real quick, I'm really glad that you said that. I've got a big rant coming at the end of the episode that is similar to that. So I'm glad that you uh, established that first and foremost. Absolutely. So this round was very disappointing, though, uh, to watch as a Star Wars fan because I did know all these answers. But then again, I'm not sitting across from Jason Inman underneath the lights at Collider Studios. Uh, sometimes your brain goes every which way, um, and that can happen. You know, we saw Jason Inman do it with the previous Star Wars question, uh, whatever you want to say about the question that was presented. To go multiple choice, I mean, she played it as best she could to try and figure her way out. She didn't take any chances. Um, it's hard to give up a two points to someone like Jason Inman. I think she probably knew that she did that. It would be tough to come back from, uh, but... I think as that round progressed, it, it, it got to her in, in a couple of ways that uh, she didn't anticipate. So especially when you get a category like Star Wars you, and, it, and it goes you know, very bad for you like this, uh, I can't imagine what it's like to answer your, your final couple questions knowing that you should have done so much better. I know you're a Star Wars guy, but try to remove yourself from what you know and look at the level of specificity within these Star Wars questions. These are not surface level questions as I often say and when you have to quote a phrase from Jabba or think of a small line from Qui-Gon about another planet that has pod racing, that's deep even for Star Wars fans and when he said that line I'm pretty sure they were showing a shrug from Padme at the time but yeah I will say that the uh, the pod racing question was pretty difficult the decoration one the Jabba one that one's a pretty difficult because you may know you may have a, a familiar idea of what it is but the exact wording is a little difficult and uh, the Rogue one I'll give I'll give you that one because it's a bunch of colors and it's a fairly recent movie you may not have rewatched it a uh, hundred times like you have the other films so I would say about you know two thirds of the round are, are pretty decently tough questions but uh I'll, I'll, I will admit it's kind of hard for me to get as neutral as possible with with the questions just because I know them. I knew the answers. But like I said, I'm not I wasn't in the studio. I'm not sitting across from Jason Inman. Had I been in the same situation, maybe my mind blanks, you, you know, as well as I know the questions at home. I, I feel for her in this situation. But uh, yeah, because we've now watched 130 Shmodown matches or more to this point, we have a pretty good sense when it comes to questions being more specific than usual but brad gilmore are you a star wars guy and what do you think of all this i'm a star wars fan i've seen all the movies multiple times but i will say i would have a problem telling you what's the color of darth vader's lightsaber i'm that i'm just kind of the guy who i just watch the movie i like the movie and uh you know it's not it's not one of those films where I retain all the information, like, you know, what other planet has pod racing? You know, what does Jabba refer to Han as? But to go to the more difficult, uh, or I guess the difficulty level of, of these questions, to answer to that concern would be this. You I mean, this isn't a regular Schmodown match. This isn't in the singles division. This is the inner geekdom match. Good point. So I think that I think that these are supposed to be slightly more difficult um, than maybe your average you know, Star Wars category, say in a regular Schmodown match. So I get that. And I and I 100% agree with Frank's point is that just because you don't know these questions doesn't mean you're not a fan of the um, series. And just, you know, once again, you could slip up. Y your pressure's on. Um, but like I said, I would have known maybe any of these. I knew the Jabba the Hutt one, and that was it. And and that was probably just off a of guess because I was able to see the multiple choice. So I think Emma Five, she fought. She fought through the round. It wasn't her best showing. Um, the questions were difficult, but I think they were supposed to be difficult. Excellent point, Brad. This is inner geekdom after all. It is supposed to be more difficult, but that leads me to another point, as there are eight Star Wars films currently, soon to be nine. We have a big five-way contender match coming up, and then the title match against Ken at Spectacular. If a particular individual thinks Tarantino's eight films are already in the obscure territory, despite only being drawn twice as a category, are we concerned that we're going to run out of reasonable Star Wars questions? Are we going to have to get ultra-specific to combat the decreasing supply? As good as Sen Witsock is, even they are bound to struggle with the number of logs needed to take out a walker in Return of the Jedi. 
You know, I would actually throw to Frank on this one. He'd probably be the best one. I, I think you can come up with a million questions, but Frank, what do you think? You know, it, it's going to be interesting. You could, There's only so many surface level questions that you can put out there. And then from there, probably you could delve deeper inside that question to get more specific. So I think what we could see is, and what we have seen in the past very intermittently, is a variation of a question and perhaps uh, of a previous question. So perhaps we'll have one question and then a couple months later we'll have a variation but a little more detailed or some other kind of detail. Um, So I think there should be plenty to go for quite some time. I mean, there's a Trivial Pursuit game out there for the original trilogy that has, like, thousands of questions. So, and you could pull from there or get ideas from there. So I think they'll they'll be all right for quite some time. Um, And if the pace of these Star Wars matches is any indication, I think we'll be okay because we're getting, like, two or three a year. So that may change in the future, but currently, I think they'll be all right for, you know, however long this goes. Because we're bound to reach this point, would you be okay with them asking questions that pertain to the franchise itself, such as production-related questions or what inspired George Lucas, Flash Gordon, among other things, or what role did Dave Fincher serve on Episode 6? In their inner geekdom, not so much. In a regular slowdown, I would be okay with it. I think the inner geekdom is really just about the films themselves, unless unless it's a a category that's going to give you an indication that Some of these questions were going to revolve outside of the movie, but do pertain to the movie. Um, I could be okay with a category that that gives you a hint or a clue as to um, it's going to be one of these outside influence uh, kind of things. Well, they've got some tough decisions to make coming up. I wouldn't mind if they dove into production matters such as what Tombstone star auditioned for the roles of Luke and Han, Kurt Russell. I'm sure people will disagree with me, but... I don't think they'll have a choice unless they get too specific, which means less points and less fun. Anyway, let's get to Jason Inman's turn as he put up nine points, including two points and steals. Brad, what was your take on Jason's turn? You know that he was like literally like you know, a, a second away, a split second away from getting DC movies as his category, which I'm sure he would have loved. He went with Marvel movies. Which was an interesting choice for him. I now I could be completely wrong, but I think he's gotten Marvel questions before and not done as well. Now that could be just you know I'm going off memory on that one. But like I said, I was surprised that he went with them, and then boom, he hit it out of the park. I mean, he knew everything. There wasn't a single question that it, he went perfect, right? He answered every single question, right? He did answer all of his questions, but he had to go to multiple choice on three different occasions. So I don't consider those perfect rounds but yes he did come away with an answer for each question plus two steals and you know like the ones that he went uh, multiple choice on the one was like what was ben Grimm's, you know blind mistress name or whatever the question was Kerry washington being the answer you know i think that was i i knew the answer but i think that was one that you most people would go multiple choice on only reason i knew that is because i had this ungodly crush on Kerry washington in the first season (laughs) of scandal so I mean that was on me. I knew I knew her filmography back and forth back then. So uh, I, I get that one. And uh, there was a couple other ones where I was like, okay, yeah, the, the other multiple choice one I can't remember off the top of my head, but I, I they were okay to go multiple choice on. It wasn't like an obvious answer. Jason Inman was so laser focused during this match, uh, and I think this round two just proved how dominant he was and how badly he wanted to be the victor in this um, match between he and Five. The Kerry Washington question, I was quite proud of myself that I knew that one. Uh, I gave myself a little bit of a fist pump there, uh, if I'm not being too modest. Uh, So, man, he crushed this category. He's six of seven questions lifetime in Marvel. So he knows his stuff. I think he he felt like he, he could go multiple choice whenever he needed to, given how Emma performed and that he already had two points uh, off of steal. So... He's feeling pretty good, and he knows he's just got to stay the course, uh, not get ahead of himself, and he did exactly what he needed to do. It's a great showing from Inman um, going forward. One of the many benefits of sealing two points during Emma's turn is that it afforded Jason the ability to use multiple choice without reservation. But yeah, Jason's proved once again that he's more than just Mr. DC All Access. He's got a handle on many sweaty categories, be it DC, Marvel, Trek, etc. 
it's pretty impressive for a guy who didn't get internet until he was 17 or 18 years old, if I recall his episode of Fradle Files correctly. <laughs> well, let's get to uh, round three, guys. It was 17 to 9. Jason Inman at this point. So, of course, Emma Fife has to go first since she's down by eight points. Hagrid gave Dursley the tail of a pig. She missed this. She's still down 17 to 9. Her three-pointer, certain of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? She missed that. That was Gimli in Lord of the Rings. So I had no idea what the heck these questions were, <laughs> where they were from. A tough go of it as Inman knocked out Emma Fife, 17 to 9. Brad, did you have any idea what these questions were talking about? The first one, absolutely. I mean, uh, Sorcerer's Stone is, is a great movie, and I watched it on repeat when I was, when I was young and, uh, I, I knew instantly it was a pig's tail. And this is what I meant earlier. When she answered that question, James Potter, um, the very first question of the match, I thought, okay, she's kind of got her confidence back when it comes to Harry Potter. She's going to be, you know, think these things through. And I think that she felt the pressure of being down so far, you know, having, you know, Inman having such a large lead on her that she didn't stop to really think about the question. Because had she thought about it, as soon as um, they said the answer was a pig's tail, she was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I can see it now. And I think that if she would have gotten that one correct had she just kind of remain calm, remain focused, and thought the question through, and she didn't. Now, when you go to the next one, I had no idea. I had no idea that was a Lord of the Rings question. My guess would have been Rocket Raccoon. That's what I thought it was. So uh, I was with her on that one. I wish Inman would have, you know, had to go. You know, that would have needed a clean sweep from Emma Fife. I, I want to see how he would have reacted if she would have come back with, uh, you know, three for three. But uh, you can't blank on stuff like that Harry Potter question. That was a softball. And even Ellis, you know, called it out. He thought even before she answered it, she was going to get it right because he said, oh, you know, it's only worth two points. I mean, you know, kind of insinuating it been better if it was a three or five because I'm sure she's going to get it. And she blanks on it. But that's the way it goes. I did not know any of these answers. I like Harry Potter, but I'm not a Potterhead, as they say. So when I heard this is like a, a two point question, I was like, wow, that's that, that's something. If that's a two point question as for the the quote. That quote sounded so familiar to me. Uh, I do like Lord of the Rings a lot. Her guess of K2SO I thought was a great guess because yeah. if you look at Gimli and K2SO, they're fairly you know similar in uh, attitude. Um, so I thought it was a great guess. And then once I heard Gimli, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I can picture the scene now and all that. So I think a lot of that was going on for Emma. She could hear the answer then. She could immediately place where it's at. You know these answers way down somewhere in your brain, but you just couldn't pull them out uh, during trivia time. Now, Brad, you're about seven to ten years younger than Frank and me. So I'm beginning to recognize that you're the Potterhead of the show. I do appreciate that. Emma at least guessed on that three-pointer. We often criticize players who don't give themselves a puncher's chance to keep themselves alive. And while I can't imagine K2SO saying, what are we waiting for? Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? Certainty of death, small chance of success definitely lines up with K2SO. But yeah, Jason Inman got the win handily, and these are the kind of matches that Inman typically wins, where there's little pressure placed on him. Had there been any sort of pressure or great expectation placed on Inman, he would have choked. That being said, I wouldn't count on him in the four-way, since Treckle and Hyde seldom win in back-to-back -back matches, individually or collectively, even though they once won three in a row. But Moving to the post-interviews, hashtag Jen at the wall, Inman said that he fears the crusher without any mention of Koi Jean Giraud, almost as if he's overlooking Koi. Frank, what do you think about Inman's post-interview comments? Yeah, very um, run-of-the-mill, I thought, very vanilla from Inman, which is fine. I mean, this post-match, given the match, uh, it's going to be tough to comment on, knowing that you still got a fatal four-way and you know he's looking forward to Hector Navarro, so it does kind of worry me that he's looking a little too far ahead, but I think with his performance, and what he was saying here is that he silenced some of the doubters, 
uh, with this match and this performance. I mean, you know, he's answered 88 percent. He missed two questions. That's I don't care who you are or, or who your opponent was. That's good stuff. But yeah, he's gonna have his hands full with Rachel. Uh, and and uh, everybody else in that four way. So just you know, a very run in the mill from Inman, and that's all I needed to be. Nothing huge and extravagant. You know, I think the only thing is, is, you know, he might be looking overlooking somebody, but he's definitely worried about the right person being the crusher. And mm-hmm. I think um, <laughs> I think if he has his, you know, if he's focused on on her. That's a good thing, and he's thinking ahead. I don't think this is going to be a one and done for Jason Inman. You know, Scott Mass is a little bit different. He flies off the handle. You know, he he's hard to control. But Inman seemed like a well-oiled machine. You know, pardon the cliche, but he was just so good in this match. You said it was eighty-eight percent or eighty-two percent of the eighty-eight percent. Eighty-eight percent. Yeah, eighty-eight percent. I mean, come on, man. You cannot beat somebody when they're answering eighty-eight percent of the questions correctly. If he can bring that into this inner geekdom match, God, man, I, I I think his sights on Hector Navarro is or is you know well well earned, and I think he's he's looking toward the right direction. If he can co- repeat this performance, oof, forget about it. You hit the nail on the head by saying if he can repeat this performance. That's exactly why I call Team Trek Trekle and Hyde because they tend to look great one match and then awful the next. This is why I'm betting against Inman in the four-way since he's never won two in a row on his own. Trek once won three in a row, but that was against three teams that have since disbanded. In 2017, Trek is one and three, including a loss to the Patriots in Heroes 1.0, which was supposed to get Trek back on track. Trek looked great against Cinema Blend in round one of the team tourney as Mance carried them via Tom Cruise while Jason quite honestly took a nap, but then action TKO Trek the very next round. Last season, Jason beat Gray Drake only to get TKO'd by Harloff and Snyder. Then, out of nowhere, after an 11 month absence from singles, Jason upsets Ben Bateman in the five way qualifier before getting TKO'd by JSR in round one of the singles tourney. Overall, he's seven and seven across all leagues and three and four individually via singles and inner geekdom. Now, to be clear, I'm not bringing all this up to bury the guy. I think Jason's got a ton of talent and knowledge. So does Mance. But for whatever reason, I just can't count on either Treckle or Hyde in back-to-back matches. However, now that I've said all this, Inman will probably win back-to-back matches for the first time ever via my reverse jinx, especially since Rachel has the pressure of being the favorite. It's going to feel like destiny. Let's get to the other side of the post-match interview as Emma and Jen Sturger had some really interesting moments together. Both acknowledged that it was weird for them given the role reversal for Emma. The only other time Jen interviewed Emma as a player was when Koi Jean Dro won June's IGD 5-way. And there was an awkward moment back then as Jen had to stand by as Araki Ishii and Fife hugged for about 10 minutes. Then, Emma said something to the effect of how it's weird to be interviewed since she does that job week in and week out. Now, at the time, Sturger wasn't getting the screen time she started getting in late August once the team tourney really got cooking. By the way, if you haven't heard our Jen Sturger interview circa August 5th, make sure to check it out. Now, I know I'm running long, guys, but I want to give my response to something you guys both touched on already, something Sturger also addressed in this post-interview. Emma really learned her lesson, as even your supposed strengths, like Star Wars, guarantee nothing in the schmodown. Now, I bring this up because she's given Team Action a lot of grief over their action and adventure struggles of late. And to that point... I'm just tired of this criticism in general, especially when commenters use such failures to devalue or second-guess a person's fandom, something you guys both pointed out. 
Team action, they like action movies. That doesn't mean they're expected to know 60 years worth of action movies, as well as adventure films, when adventure has nothing to do with their team moniker. If questions are specific enough, you can stump just about any player, even in their reputed strong suits. Sam Witwer knows the ins and outs of Star Wars, just like I know the ins and outs of Breaking Bad better than anyone on this planet. However, Sam has eight films to pull from while I have 62 episodes to learn inside and out. The action category, the sci-fi category, the dance category are putative advantages for certain players that favor those genres more than most, but that doesn't mean they're expected to know something as specific as the needle drop that was used in the third act of The Man Who Would Be King, even if the prodigious Drew McQueenie did. So I wish we'd stop punishing players and their fandom if they struggle with their perceived strong points when specificity can beat anyone. Anything to add, Frank? No, I think, uh, you know, I touched on it earlier and and you followed up nicely with it, Brian. There's nothing more I think uh, I could add to it. And I just hope I hope uh, the fans out there who watch the show and watch Emma's performance realize what we're trying to say. And, And that's not just true for Emma in this case, but. Uh, it's true for everyone else past and, and, and in the future. So um, if we can just all keep that in mind. I'm sure there are certain questions about my favorite film franchises that I think I'm really knowledgeable about that I would miss. You know, have, have you all ever taken those, uh, you know, you're, you're not doing your job at work and you take those little quizzes <laughs> that pop up. And it's like, oh, all see, time. test your back to the future knowledge. I did that one time and I'm like, I'm going to kill this. This is my thing. And I remember like one of the questions was so specific. It was, what was the name of the motel directly to Marty's left when he's getting ready to go back, back to the future? I'm like, what the hell? Holy Fun crap. Fact, though, it ended up being the Bluebird Motel. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. I know exactly what, you know, an action would go through or Emma Fife would go through in their given categories of strength. So uh, I agree. Just because you are well versed in the movie or in the franchise or in the series or in the genre definitely does not mean you will know every little thing. Again, specificity can be the enemy and the undoing of just about anyone. But guys, more importantly, there's a really interesting thing happening right now. So Please indulge me yet again. Last week, the Grace and Emma feud ended abruptly as interim commish Thad made Emma an impartial interviewer moving forward, even though she's been the quote-unquote face interviewer for quite some time in comparison to Grace's heel. This feud cost Emma some popularity points among the fans, given her perceived bias. She'd treat the faces properly, even stretching the truth in their favor, while the heels would get the heel treatment from her. Conversely, Grace was a heel to everyone for the most part, even her own stable at times, but she didn't get as much heat as Emma did because Grace stuck to being a heel no matter what, barring that special black butterfly match. But now that Thad's fired Grace's interviewer, Emma can now be neutral, something that's worked wonders for Jen Sturger's popularity. Hashtag fervor for Sturger. That's fervor with an O, folks. I see a lot of misspellings despite my appreciation for the gesture itself. So the question then became, could Emma regain the favor she once had before the Grace rivalry did more to help Grace's popularity than it did Emma's? Keep in mind, it wasn't just the fans who were calling Emma out, referring to her by certain nicknames, or treating her coarsely. Even players like JSR, Snyder, and Andrako have really taken it to her. The same goes for all of Top Den, as well as Team Action and Jamie and Washington. And while I've never condoned anyone's name calling or their attacks on Emma's appearance, be it her fashion sense, her hairstyle, or her traits that she simply cannot change, I too have been critical of Emma's embellishments and idiosyncrasies, and to be brutally honest, I'm just not 
a fan of her on-camera persona, and it's nothing against her personally. She just never clicked for me. And some people connect with you, some people don't. There are people who really like me, but there are plenty of people who hate my guts over things that I cannot change, like my own voice, or for the fact that I have no love loss for a team of individuals that receive the most advantages and opportunities, as well as the biggest push, preference, and priority, despite others deserving it just as much, if not more. The point is, certain people are just polarizing, and their storylines are so divisive not divisive, that fans can't help but choose sides. And unfortunately for Emma, she got the short end of the stick when it came to the interviewer rivalry. And while Grace may have won her battle with Emma, Jen Sturger won the interview war as Christian brilliantly installed her as the neutral interviewer from day one. But then this match happened, Inman v. Fife. It began with Mark and Draco at the desk, calling the match, something he's never done before, and almost immediately, he uncharacteristically apologized to Emma for going after her fashion sense a few weeks ago. Then, Emma got beat handily by Inman during the match, which set up the post-interview between Emma and Jen, which started awkwardly and ended emotionally as Emma was genuinely upset about her performance. She clearly felt humiliated, and Sturger offered her words of encouragement right before Jason Inman interrupted the interview to provide her with a wonderful embrace, reminding her how integral she's been to the Schmodown success. And remember, folks, it's not easy for Emma or any woman to compete in the Schmodown, let alone any YouTube competition with a male-dominated audience. And as we all know, the internet, especially social media and its inner pop culture space, is much crueler toward women than it is toward men. So let's be clear, this is not an issue that is exclusive to the Schmodown. Heck, life is much crueler toward women than than men, something history has proven to us time and time again, as well as Hollywood of late, not that we didn't know such behavior took place already. So even though this match was quite painful for Emma, there is a silver lining to it. This is the best character turn or reputation rehab that Emma could ever ask for because she's finally earned back some favor as well as empathy from the fans who kind of turned on her because they didn't like her quote-unquote face interviewer storyline. Even I felt bad for her. So I'll be very curious to see how Emma's new role as impartial interviewer number two builds off of this moment. As long as she stops stretching the facts, I think there's hope for a complete turnaround. So the league really picked the perfect time to end the grace Emma interviewer feud as it led us right into today's match against Inman. This might be one of Christian's most masterful strokes yet as far as building story around the real circumstances that emerge from each match's result. Anyway, sorry for running long, you guys, but I found this to be very important, and while I'm sure you and the general audience didn't read into it quite like I did, Do you think this is the best thing that could ever happen to Emma's overall popularity and approval rating? I I didn't really look at it that way, to tell you the truth. Sure, I felt bad for Emma because she felt bad about her performance. But at the same time, as that was happening, I actually said to myself that I appreciate the passion that Emma has for the Schmodown. If you're that upset about your performance... That means you're really invested in this in this showdown, and that is something that I can totally get behind. As for her personality on the show goes and, and the way she interacts with other faces or heels, that's something I didn't think about that now I will be looking for a little bit more in the future to see how her role is, is adjusted going forward when she interviews certain people. Um, it will be interesting. I didn't really – I didn't pick that up. 
uh, if that's what was being laid down. So um, I'll have to keep an eye on that, or maybe I'll just go back and watch the match again. Look, I follow the comments quite closely, and many fans were outraged by Thad's decision to fire Grace in order to make Emma impartial interviewer number two when they've seen what they consider to be overwhelming bias from Emma, including the many facts she stretched for her favorites. So the arrival of this match couldn't come at a better time as far as potentially changing her critics' minds about her moving forward, especially now that the league has made the decision to go with Emma over Grace as impartial interviewer number two. Now, Brad, since you're the new guy, I'm not sure how closely you follow the comments in reaction to storylines, but do you think Emma's emotional match will help her regain the considerable amount of favor she lost during the long feud with Grace? Out of the three interviewers, I was always a big Ginger Sturger fan out of the three, but I think Emma 5 for me has always been cool. Like, I never had a really big issue. I think of the great interviewers of our time, right, uh, when you think about wrestling or, or sports reporting or Schmodown, what have you. You know, Mean Gene Oakland was the best. And Mean Gene was impartial, and I say that, you know, with quotations going in the air, with air quotes, because to the, you know, good guys, he was there. To the bad guys, he'd kind of be sarcastic and call him out a little bit, but he was the babyface announcer. So I think that's kind of an inherent trait of the babyface. If you are a good guy, sometimes it's hard to not point out the villain traits of the person you're interviewing. Sometimes it's hard to refrain from that. So I never really got off on that thing. I never really knocked her so much for it. But hey, if it's over, if that deems it to be over and you know now we're back at a neutral position, I think it's good for Emma Fife. I don't think she really needed any repair in my eyes, but I know there are those out there who have voiced criticisms. For them, maybe this is a nice little reset button. For me, hey, it's all good. Given what she said about opponent's choice after JSR's loss to Levine, it wasn't a big deal to us, but to others, it started to become a bigger and bigger deal the more that it happened. So I'm sure she's not listening, but as long as she keeps her facts and numbers in check, I think today's match is going to mend a lot of fences. This was the first time I felt for five, so... That's gotta be progress, right? Anyway, just a quick programming note. We recorded this Tuesday night before we've seen Friday's four-way, so it'll be quite interesting to see how things play out as of this conversation. So we'll be back in a few days after this very short commercial break. Enjoying the Schmodown Rundown? If you answered yes, then we encourage you to step inside the magical world of SK Plus, a YouTube channel with podcast programming that has been handpicked and vetted by visionary audiophiles Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis, combining their love for stand up comedy independent film and sports entertainment, Harloff and Ellis continue to break new ground, something you'd expect from the first YouTube cinephiles to be certified by Rotten Tomatoes. With programs like Andres Cabrera and Robert Butler III's The Meaning Of, or William Bibiani and Whitney Seibold's Critically Acclaimed, you are bound to find a voice that enriches your mind, body, and soul. Remember to subscribe to SK+, hit the like button, and comment on your program of choice. Are you constantly on the go? SK+, programming can also be found on the Schmoes No podcast feed via iTunes or wherever you enjoy podcasts last but not least tell a friend about your sk plus experience or better yet share the gift that keeps on giving every single day of the week let's get you back to the schmodown rundown All right, we're back after a short break for you, the audience, but a few days for us. We hope everyone had a lovely 
and fancy Thanksgiving. Frank, how was your Thanksgiving? Oh, it was delightful and uh, very stuffing and a lot of wine. What about you, Mr. Gilmore? You know, I had a great Thanksgiving. You know, I uh, hung out with the family, ate turkey, took a nap, and then I had to go Christmas tree shopping. But everything went well. I can't complain. That sounds delightful. Now, we don't have a lot of news for this week. You know, there's a lot of news within the four-way match we're about to discuss. But I want to go over one quick thing with you guys. As as you know, I love to give out competitor tips, even though they probably don't need tips from the guy that does the podcast. But I love thinking that I can spot certain trends that will help people's games. And in this case, I have one word, Netflix. I was scanning Netflix yesterday during Thanksgiving break, and I noticed how many titles have been used as questions in recent memory. This was highlighted by City of God, a question that JTE got recently in that Sam Levine match. I couldn't believe he pulled this at the time, but since it's on Netflix right now, I'm no longer surprised that he may have perhaps seen it in passing as he too likely scans Netflix. So as always, folks, get a handle on these things such as Netflix because you never know what Tricky Scalisi is going to pull. Check on those details, those actors, those filmmakers, those plots, and try to take away any surface level details from Netflix selection of films. So I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but it is something that I've been meaning to bring up for a while now. But to the inner Geekton four-way between Jay Washington, Koi Jandro, Jason Inman, and Rachel Cushing, we had some Thad Fabe to start this match. We had the contract signing between Team Action and Team Top 10. Now, here's how it breaks down. Action, they get a title match, basically the loser of Patriots versus ATL above the line, as we would presume. So nothing really changes for Action as they would have been in a number one contender match like this one anyway. They just have to play a team that they really shouldn't have to play again. So it's a very unusual number one contender match for them. Conversely, top 10, they now get a number one contender match if they beat Team Action. Now, this is not number one contender status if they win. They simply get a number one contender match if they beat Team Action. So I'd imagine they'd have to play MODOK unless we're officially bypassing them. But I would assume if T10 wins that they would have to play MODOK since MODOK played the Patriots better than anyone. However, the big stipulation here is if Top 10 loses, they have to break up for a year. Now, Frankie J, you're a big fan of the Outlaw Nation or whatever they call it over there. How do you feel about these stipulations? I think the stipulations are pretty fair uh, for team action. Yeah, all things are the same considering whoever they would have to play, but they have an added incentive to play top 10 now because if they beat them, they kick them out for a year. Uh, I do like that stipulation. Top 10 has been uh, a focal point in the team league for quite some time really since 2015, at the end of 2015 season, uh, back before uh, the Collider days. As far as who uh, they could play in a number one contenders match, I don't know. It could be uh, top that, depending on how things work out. I don't, you're right, Brad. We don't know what's going on with MODOK. That would be fun to see MODOK go into a number one contenders match. Team action, whoever they play between ATL and Patriots is going to be a fun match regardless. Uh, if they do, in fact, beat top 10. Had Wolves of Steel not disbanded, that's who Team Action would be playing, I think. But because of the retirements and the unforeseen inaction of other teams, worthy teams like Bodak or even formerly IGN, top that, the situation top 10 has somewhat lucked into, I will say. Brad, what do you think of the contracts? What do you think of these stipulations? Well, you know, I think the stipulations are fair. Team Action has proved in this uh, season of the Schmodown, that they are a fantastic team and they are definitely a force. And I think, you know, future champions, some might say. And, you know, I think they have every right to ask for this stipulation. You know, I love John Steven Roca. I'm a big fan of Outlaw and Nation in general. Uh, team top 10, though, as noteworthy as some of their matches may have been, they're still a round of 500 team. You know, they almost win as much as they lose or vice versa. So I think that, if they do lose this match, which, you know, is possible, I think this is actually would be the best thing for 
John Stephen Roca at this point in his career. I think he needs to refocus. But can I say Thad, as the interim commissioner, has been making matches people want to see and implementing stipulations that make those matches more interesting. And he has done, so far, a phenomenal job as the interim commissioner. I mean, I, I do hope that action wins just because I do think the best thing for JSR is to put top 10, the team, on the back burner for a while. He's got to get his singles career right. I still think he needs a break from singles in general just to to recharge his batteries and to fix some holes in his game. We'll talk more about that later. And uh, Frank, I like that you brought up top that formerly IGN. I, I wouldn't mind them potentially getting a number one contender shot if there's enough time to build up to that. And by the way, when I said that top 10 and top that have similar team names, I didn't just mean top as the first word. I meant the second word also being monosyllabic. So it's very similar in that sense too. But all in all, I'm very pleased with this Thad Fabe package. Thad's been doing a great job in this interim commissioner role, doing some very entertaining stuff. And I don't know why Roka keeps denying the fact that he pushed for this number one contender match at Spectacular. He's like, all I wanted to do was play you guys. And that's simply not true. He was pushing Harloff for this match at Spectacular ever since they lost to action. So, I mean, it's on record and they're not just going to have a standard match with no stakes at Spectacular. Of course, it's going to be number one contender with significant stakes, but I'm glad that the fans uh, spoke out, and I'm glad that we have found kind of a, a good compromise in between. So, Frank, let's start with you. Uh, we had Jay's promo, Inman, Jean Dro, and Cushing. Which promo caught your eye? Jay's. <laughs> he talks a lot of smack, um, talks a big game when he barely scraped by against Robert Meyer Burnett, when in fact, statistically, he performed worse than Robert Meyer Burnett. He just hit the big points when it mattered. Uh, Jay was in like the 40 percentile range of correct answers for that match. So his confidence comes through in this promo. Uh, doesn't care how he performed. He just knows that he won and that he's here. He has a shot. And uh, as we will see, he uh, he pretty much lived up to his hype. Brad, what promo caught your eye? We know uh, there were two of them, but I got to agree with Frank. Jay Washington. I got to meet Jay uh, in L.A. a few months ago, and we sat and talked. And he, I didn't know this, but he comes from a pro wrestling background anyway. So he already knows the tricks of the trade on how to cut a good promo. He hits him with, with his catchphrase at the end. I thought his was the strongest of the bunch. But I don't mean to call him out again. <laughs> my, guy, my guy, Jason Inman, something's going on here. And, you know, Earlier in the week, he somewhat compares, be it accidentally or purposefully, Emma Fife to Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and then today, <laughs> in Friday's match, he compares Christian Harloff to the devil. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with Jason Inman. Something is seriously wrong with this man. He's making these extreme comparisons, but I did think he had a good promo, uh, spite saying that our former commish was Satan himself. <laughs> I guess that's what happens when you walk out with JSR for a match. The heelness in JSR rubbed off on uh, Jason Inman, and yeah, he did seem a bit more heelish than usual. He was talking about how He's finally getting what he wanted a year ago when he was first overlooked at Spectacular's five-way in 2016. Inman then took shots at Koi and Jay, saying how they don't belong in this match. He thinks they're lucky. The one rub, though, against Jason Inman's heelish ways of late is the fact that he came in during Emma's post-interview and kind of gave her a hug and told her, how important she was to the Schmodown when she was having kind of an emotional moment. So that kind of undid any heelish attempts that he's doing lately. So I have to bring that up. But yeah, Jay Jay started off, though, with Stacy speaking for him. So I like the role reversal. Stacy finally beginning for Jay and not Jay beginning for Stacy. Of course, Jay criticized Rachel Cushing, as you'd expect. And he called Jason Inman a clown. That was a uh, a strange thing to say. I don't know if I'd call Jason Inman a clown, but Koi Jandro, very vanilla. I love everything. He's nervous. He's chasing <laughs> his own Mario Kart ghost, which I guess was the, the most interesting thing he said. And then Rachel called out Jay's two-facedness. She wants this four-way big time, especially after that five-way match in March cost her a win against Joker Johns, mainly because of that version's format. So I think Rachel's quite hungry, and you can tell that 
in these promos. So let's get to entrances. Frank, let me hear your thoughts on any of the entrances. What was your favorite? I do appreciate Jason Inman going back to Doctor Who. I am a big Doctor Who fan, even though uh, that category, that franchise would not be in the inner geekdom. It's still a very geeky thing. So uh, out of all of them, I did appreciate Jason Inman going back to uh, Mr. Baker's version of Doctor Who. Brad, which entrance struck a chord with you the most? I did like Rachel Cushing's entrance with the, you know, after effects, the little, you know, spark off the wand when she pointed at the screen. But I also like Jay Washington stealing Bobby Roode's swagger and coming out to Glorious. I thought, though, overall, even Coy coming out to Eminem's Rap God sporting the Conor McGregor t-shirt, I thought everybody brought it, you know, pretty decently in the entrances. I, I was a fan of pretty much everyone's. Well, I'm glad you guys reminded me that Jason Justice Inman dressed like Doctor Who because I thought he was dressing like Darren Aronofsky with those <laughs> scarves. But what I found interesting about Jay Washington's entrance, besides the, the Bobby Roode stuff, which I am very impressed by the homage, was that there was little fanfare. So I think the exit of Brianne Chandler is already apparent in terms of the Misfits. This is the most stripped down entrance we've ever seen involving the Misfits. So Chandler's presence is already missed. And crazy Koi Jean Giraud, he was eating pudding as he walked out. Sadly for Koi, that gag was already used a couple times by Chandler and, of course, KO. So uh, a little late to the game, Koi. Nonetheless, I'm glad he's here. And Rachel the Crusher Cushing, instead of the usual Sarah Connor stuff that I love so much, she did a Harry Potter thing, which I'm meh about, but at least she had the cool VFX wand, courtesy of Aaron Wilhelm and all the post-production guys. So let's get to round one. At the end of round one, 10 questions. Jason Inman had a perfect round. Jay Washington had seven points, Koi Jean with four, and Rachel with seven Jason Inman got a bonus question, the boombox guy for the Joker in Batman 89. That was Lawrence, the guy with the handlebar mustache. He guessed incorrectly. He said Bob the Goon. So Jason Inman's perfect round is already establishing that my reverse jinx from Tuesday's discussion is already in effect. Frank, what were your takeaways from this round one of play? I like that uh, this round started off with everyone getting the first three questions right. It really set the table for the intensity of this match. Jason, he has been he has been so strong in the first round through just about every single Inner Geekdom match. And for him to finally have a perfect round here. Well, he did have a perfect round in his other Fatal Five-Way when it was just six questions. When they went through six, he was six of six before they cut it short. So to get 10 here, it was very impressive, especially when you're going up against Rachel Cushing. Very unfortunate on that uh, MCU question, the Tony Stark one, because the wording of that question it has to be a specific way. So I understand how only uh, Jason and uh, Jay only got that one. Rachel, she kind of flipped up there at the end, which let Jay back into it and tie it up there. It's a very interesting first round. I hate to say this. I wasn't that surprised by Coy's performance. It just kind of goes back to his previous performance. He won the last time he was there. I know, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And and, we'll, and we find out. So <laughs> Obviously, everyone expected Jason Inman and Rachel Cushing to come out swinging, and they did. I mean, Jason Inman, that perfect round, even though he missed the bonus question, I was still impressed that he even got Bob. Because I was sitting there, I was like, I have no idea which the Joker's henchmen's names were. I think, though, impressive for me, at the end of the round, Jay Washington and Rachel Cushing were neck and neck. And I could not believe, and you know me, and fans, as I, as I continue to be on this show, you will realize that Back to the Future is everything for me. Nobody can start this car but me. And we had three Back to the Future questions, by the way, in this inner geek to match. I think it should be a, its own category on the wheel, but that's besides the point. The fact that um, Rachel Cushing said that the contraption that Doc Brown created in the blacksmith shop in Back to the Future 3 was something to make gold with. I, I was like, he's not an alchemist. You know, he made <laughs> it was a refrigerator. He made an ice cube. How do you not remember that one? That one was, even for someone the caliber of Rachel Cushing, I was like, you gotta know it's an ice cube. So that was one of the things that stuck out, and that was the question that let Jay Washington slip in there and tie it up. Coy Jandrew, I think, you know, he was out of it after the first four or five questions. I, I knew already this guy doesn't, he's not gonna make it to the end here. He's not winning this thing. He was just a body to you know, make it a fatal four-way <laughs> at the end of the day. Honestly, I mean, that's how I felt. Even though he won, we know he won. 
but he was just outmatched, I think, in this game. So I was really impressed with Jay Washington in this first round, but obviously Inman took the round. Yeah, Jay was definitely a surprise as to how well he played, not just in round one, but overall. Now, I've often theorized that announcers, the announcers at the desk, gain a lot of information and improve their games a significant amount by just calling matches, by having exposure to all the information and questions. It gets their their brain sharp. It gets them thinking about films that they haven't normally thought about in a while. It gets them familiar with Skaliski's taste. He likes to pull many questions from certain films. He's got his favorites. And the fact that there were three Back to the Future questions combined with the element of JSR calling this match, I think this was a backdoor way of helping (laughs) JSR learn Back to the Future, something that he has not been able to do on his own in his own time. So Fruit of the Looms. <laughs> I see what's happening here. You cannot uh, put this past me. Yeah, this was an interesting round for a number of reasons. Question four, Cassie Nandor, the actor who played him, Diego Luna. It goes to show you how unmemorable that character was when two players missed that Jay and Koi. And then moving to the demon in the minds of Moria, whatever the heck that is. Rachel then blurted out, ask a hard one. And then JSR responded, oh, learning from Ken Knapsack. Of course, I mean, this is in reference to Ken and Rachel being partners, but that's not really a Ken Knapsack style of statement. That is more like a heel statement. That's not really Ken's thing. So I'm not sure what JSR was going for there. And question nine, I was shocked that only one person, Jason Inman, could name the writer behind Man of Steel, David Goyer. So that surprised me as well for inner geekdom. And then, of course, question 10, the Back to the Future, the huge machine that Doc built. We talked about how this is probably a conspiracy just to help JSR learn. Interesting round nonetheless. Let's go to round two. So first off, Jason deferred to Rachel and Rachel opts to go first, which is her preference anyway. And guess what? She spun Harry Potter, just like she was dressed as some kind of Harry Potter character. Again, if I was any sort of Potterhead, I would know something about Potterville, whatever you call it. But uh, question <laughs> question yeah. one, no problem. Question two, no problem. Question three, no problem. Six point turn for Rachel. So Brad, let me get your thoughts on Rachel's perfect Harry Potter round. Well, first of all, Gryffindor, learn that phrase and, and, and commit it to memory. Please. He played for the Rams in 1979, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. St. Louis Rams. So anyway, when uh, when Rachel Cushing spun Harry Potter, I mean, the crowd lost it. They knew this was going to be an easy category. This is like her spinning Oscars. There's just some things that we know in life are certain. We know grass is green, sky is blue, and Rachel Cushing will go perfect on Harry Potter or Oscars most of the time. So I uh, I thought that this was a great way for her to start out. I thought this was also a great strategy by Jason Inman. Let me see what I got to get to. All right, let me see what where is the bar. I always remember, you know, in all kinds of, you know, competition, a lot of the times you want to see what you got to get to. You know, almost like um, if you ever had to give a speech in class, you didn't want to be the very first person. You wanted to see what the, you know, what someone else would say first, how they deliver their speech before you go up and do it. So you can kind of alter your strategy accordingly. I think that's what Jason Edmond was doing here. And uh, we saw that it played out well for him. But great first series of questions for Rachel Cushing. When Rachel got Harry Potter, I was very excited for Rachel. I was definitely rooting for Rachel in this match. But at the same time, I have to go back and look at other people who are strong in Harry Potter and how it hasn't been kind to them. And so I thought I was just hoping that these were questions that Rachel could get. I'm not a huge Harry Potter fan, so I didn't know any of these questions, any of these answers. But I was just hoping that these questions would be so obscure or the details so fine that Rachel would you know not know the answer because we would see later on when we well we'll talk about Jason Inman but I was just happy and thrilled that Rachel went three for three for six points in this um and it served to be an important thing I think because when Jason Inman deferred to Rachel and she goes because that's the one person that he's looking at the most and now that he knows what she did he knows that when he comes to his spin He may have to go for broke if need be, but we'll get there when we get there. If Fantastic Beast ever ends up in inner geekdom, we're going to have a problem. (laughs) We're going to have a big problem. 
Well, Jason Inman had the choice to defer again, and that's what he did. He deferred to Jay, who then deferred to Koi. Koi spun villains. And there was an interesting moment here. As Christian Harloff said, John Roca will administer these villain questions. And Christian kind of realized what he was saying, and he kind of drifted off as he was saying it, because obviously John Roca is a villain in the Schmodown, and the way that he phrased this introduction uh, was just so fitting. I'll take villains. They're going to take All villains. Right. All, right. All right. John Roca will administer. And remember, of course, John Roca will administer the villain question so frank give me your thoughts on koi's villain round yeah that was a funny transition from christian to roca and i don't know if, if christian also saw the first question that was going to be koi so further <laughs> just realizing in his head what the words john roca is gonna have to say for the first question uh, again going back to your little conspiracy theory which is a fun little nugget in this match uh koi's second round here in villains yeah not good <laughs> there's two dark horse comic questions in this match I think the first time we've had that happen. So Koi's second round, not so good, uh, despite his only two-pointer in the Back to the Future question, which is pretty funny that John gave that question. We don't get a lot of Dark Horse stuff, but here we are, and everyone ended up stealing that question for the answer. I didn't know it, but uh, that just goes to show how much I know about Hellboy. Well, I'm glad that he came back around after the... um back to the future three question and did answer correctly this time with the same answer uh being manure biff manure everyone remembers that uh, maybe except for john roca <laughs> and um he went multiple choice on the second one missed i gotta be honest with you you know thor dark world not one that just really resonated with me and that i remember a lot about and then hellboy although i enjoyed the film i could not remember rasputin i just couldn't remember it so you know, had you never seen the films or only seen them once, it might have been a little bit difficult to uh, come up with the answers. Now, I know that Koi Jandrew had uh, Marvel movie news behind his belt, so he maybe he should have been a little bit more on the ball on that question than I would have been. But still, not a great round. I mean, not a great round at all. And this just kind of it continues his perils from round one, just – Knowing a couple, but not knowing enough. Yeah, there were too many Thor the Dark World questions in this match, and I don't even know if there were more than two, but it felt like there were more than two. <laughs> there were a lot of Thor questions in general, and I, I have to believe that this match probably taped around the time that uh, Ragnarok came out, just because it seemed to be on everybody's mind. I think Koi even referenced it as well. And yeah, he is the host of uh, Marvel Movie News, so the knowing the Dark World is, is quite important. Algorithm, I guess. Stolen by Rachel, of course, and the Hellboy villain, I've never seen any of those films, so the fact that everybody stole it is impressive as far as I'm concerned, but two points for Koi out of six, it is not Koi's day whatsoever. Now it's Jay's turn to spin, he spun Heroes, he spun again, and he got Heroes again, so I repeat of the first category he spun and no, he did not use the Brian David spin method, BDSM, because he moved it two ticks, not one. So it did not work in his favor. Frank, what was your impression of your good buddy Jay Washington's round? Yeah, I've been pretty critical of Jay in the inner geekdom or just overall. But he really surprised me in this round. And he had to go through three distinct different franchises, Indiana Jones, Lord of the Rings, and the MCU. And he came away with five out of the possible six points, having to go to multiple choices on that Indiana Jones question. But very impressive on the Lord of the Rings question. Very impressive in regards to the MCU questions uh, that he had to get. But as much as a fan I am of Lord of the Rings, that 111 years old answer, um, that's pretty good. That kind of escapes the mind a little bit. And then the Ant-Man question, that's a movie that I don't think a lot of people have probably had repeat viewings of. But for him to know that, and that probably goes back to his comic book knowledge in general, where he can pull up that answer, uh, it just goes to show that when he hits certain categories, he can be pretty spot on. Yeah, five points out of six for Jay. And when he answered that 111th birthday in Fellowship of the Ring, the entire studio did a double take. They're like, wow, is, is this Jay Washington? Yeah. Is this the same guy that we've been watching spout into microphones the last six months? So. He was impressive all day. That was incredible. I mean, I I did I had no idea. 
it, the look on his face originally, I thought that he was kind of taken aback. He's like, oh, and then he just spit out the answer. And I'm telling you, not only did the studio, in-studio audience uh, give him a great reaction, I popped like he was the Road Warriors in 88, 89, <laughs> brother, because he he blew the roof off the place over here at the Gilmore household. I was so impressed by that. And a five at five out of possible six, and I just watched the Last Crusade recently, so I remember that line when he went multiple choice and he said D. I'm like, that's my guy. Jay Washington is quickly going up my list of you know some of my favorite, at least personalities in the Schmodown, and I think his performance met his charisma here today. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get to a Jason Inman's turn. As he spun Star Trek, so more luck is on his side. Clearly, my reverse jinx on Tuesday is powering him in this match as we've seen throughout this match. And if Rachel Cushing got Harry Potter, then of course Jason Inman, a member of Team Trek, Trek on Hyde, is going to get Star Trek. But just because you get your strength, that doesn't mean it always works out for you as he got three out of an available six points. So guys, this follows up our long discussion earlier this week about how a poor performance in a perceived strong category doesn't diminish you as being an authority on that subject or certainly being a real fan. As I've been saying, specificity can undo just about anyone. So yeah, I mean, three out of possible six, he had to go multiple choice on the very first question. Got it right, though. And then that Captain Styles question threw everyone for a loop. Nobody knew it. And But you would think that is kind of a question or a piece of trivia that somebody who does flank the you know colors of Team Trek might know, but he didn't, and I'm not going to fault him for it. Not as impressive as Rachel Cushing when she got her strong suit, but just the batch of questions didn't come up in his favor. Sometimes you got you know, you got to play the hand you're dealt, and he wasn't dealt pocket aces. So he let's see if he recovers going into round three. He still had a good lead. I mean, he still had points on the board where he was still in striking distance, I should say. So it wasn't his best round. Had he gotten the six out of six, he might have been able to put a bow on this whole entire game, but he made it that more interesting. It's important to note that the first Trek film to win an Oscar was a recycled question. I always like to keep track of those. And Captain Styles, that's actually a distant relative of Julia Styles. So I thought I'd point that out for the audience in case they were wondering. <laughs> yeah, when he spun Trek, I said this guy is destined to make it to the spectacular. He just had everything going his way. It's very similar uh, in terms of the tournaments we just saw. When people go on these runs to get favorable categories, like like Team Above the Line, getting Spinner's Choice and just hitting 70s or 80s, Jason Emmett has been in somewhat of a tournament mode style these this week in regards to inner geekdom and you go on these incredible runs and it continues here by spinning trek but like i was fearful for rachel in terms of the questions she would get he got the versions of questions i was afraid rachel would get he got hit with a an academy award winning question and then this highly detailed very minute part of star trek 3 who's the starfleet uh, whatever uss uss excelsior uh the commander uh, even he was just completely befuddled by it, so that just told me just how obscure of a question this is. If Jason Inman doesn't even have a hint of what the answer could be, because he went to multiple choice, I think, almost immediately. So that was very surprising. But three out of six, and I think what he was down just one point going to the one point to, to Rachel. So yeah, and then at that point with Rachel having the lead. And as strong as a player as she is, uh, this was certainly going to come down to the wire. And I thought Rachel um, had very good chances to pull this out. Going into round three, it's 14 points for Jason Inman, 13 for Jay Washington, 6 for Koi Jean Giroux, and 15 for our leader, Rachel Cushing. So Koi, since he's bringing up the rear, he's going to go to his two-pointer. Thor's release year, another Thor question. He missed it. Came out in 2011, he guessed 2010, and and typically when people miss these movie release year questions in round three, they're almost always in the ballpark. They're almost always within range, and that's that's the tough part about movie release years or movie release dates. It's because you always know the general vicinity, but you're just always one or two years off, and Koi suffered this extremely, and then his three-pointer 
Ghost Rider's girlfriend, played by Eva Mendez. He managed to pull that out. So I'm glad that Koi was able to pull out that Marvel property since the bosses over at Marvel Movie News would have been quite concerned now that he's the lead host given the exit of Matt Key. And then his five-pointer, the tribe that chases Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark. He missed it. The answer was Hovitos, I believe that's the pronunciation. So Koi Jandro could not follow up his prior win with another one. He was the first to go with nine points. So very disappointing showing. And he tried to get up by mistake. Perhaps he thought it was free for all. Perhaps he thought it was some kind of fatal match where he had to just get up and leave. So it was a funny moment when everyone's like, hey, you can stay and watch the, the rest of the match. So Fun stuff there. Yeah, his first question, the two-pointer movie release date, Thor, whenever I play along watching these matches or I even play on the app and I get a movie release date, I am about 95% of the time, I'm always off by like a year and it just pisses me off to no end because you're right, you're just within the ballpark and you're either off one or two years and it it can get quite maddening. Uh, His Marvel uh, question, the Ghost Rider... I was glad to see him get that one. His three-pointer, though, A Tribe That Chases Indy at the Beginning of Raiders. Uh, I've seen that movie countless times, and I could not tell you that. That's a pretty good five-pointer. It's just an overall disappointing performance from Koi. But then again, again, I don't want to be too hard on the guy. Statistically speaking, performed worse here than he did in his win, if you will, against Mike Kalinowski in that five-way. So things aren't looking too good for Koi, but he does have his strengths. And if he can just get on a lucky run, perhaps he can he can use that to his advantage in future intergeekdom matches. That five pointer was a true five pointer. I mean, that one was definitely a deep pull. I don't know if if the name of the tribe was ever said. I, I was trying to think of it, and uh, I don't I don't recall it. I know it had to be, or it wouldn't be a question. I should say, but man, that was a that was a hard hard question. And it's okay, I think, if you're Koi Jandrew to fall on your sword for that five pointer, because I think um, everyone on this show and maybe everyone on that table would have done so as well. I just checked the Raiders of the Lost Ark script and Hovitos is said in the film, the Hovitos are near, the poison is still fresh. Three days, they're following us. So it Mm. was said in the movie, but yeah, this is not something that you would typically pull away. But uh, yeah, that is a true five pointer. So one dropped line in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, I mean, that is definitely an inner geekdom five-point question if I've ever heard one. Well, Jay Washington was up next with his two-pointer, who played Barb Wire in Barb Wire. Of course, that's Pamela Anderson. Perhaps she was Pamela Anderson Lee at the time or Pamela Lee at the time. I can't remember. But, oh, my God. Oh, my God. How (laughs) does Jay Washington not get this? let alone not use a repeat for this. I mean, is this a matter of inexperience? Did he not realize that he could use a repeat here? I have no idea why he didn't buy himself some more time. And keep in mind, Barbed Wire came out at the peak of Pam's power. She was like the Kim Kardashian of that era, only she had at least a little bit of talent. She was a, a working actor. So this was shocking that Jay Washington could not come up with this. I I cannot believe it. Brad, what was your reaction to Jay's miss on this? I think he might have had an inkling of who it was. He wasn't sure at all. And I think that he was like, well, if I ask for the repeat, I'll get some extra time, but I might still not pull that name. So let me save it just in case. I kind of think that's what the situation was. When they said barbed wire, of course, Pam Anderson, most people that just kind of, if you're a movie fan, especially in the inner geekdom world, if you like your... You know, this is a Dark Horse comic, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so if you're a Dark Horse guy, you should you should probably know this. It's a little bit on the fringe, though. I'm not good on my movie release dates, and I could probably do a quick Wikipedia or Google search, but I think it's like 94, 95, 96, somewhere in that era. So it could be one of those forgotten films. So I'm not going to come down too hard on my guy, Jay Washington, but be it, it is inner geekdom, you probably should have came up with that answer, but it's okay. It was okay. I wasn't... I wasn't too upset by it. This isn't a question that requires you to see the movie to know. This movie made a lot of headlines, much like Elizabeth Berkley's Showgirls, just because of who was in the movie, the type of movie that it was. Pam was so famous at the time. Plus, Tommy Lee was 
on set causing a ruckus the whole time. So that made news headlines. So I can't believe Jay could not pull this. I mean, even my mom probably could have answered this given how famous Pam was at the time and whatever project she was in at the time, even something as ridiculous as barbed wire. So not every film requires you to see it as long as you pay attention to the news. And this was something that was rather newsworthy. Frank, do you have anything to add on this? I'm sure you knew the answer to this. I did. And when I saw this question, I whispered to myself, Pam Anderson? I never saw the movie. But I can remember seeing the VHS cover of her on the cover yeah. with the with the you know the title, and every time I go into the movie store, I would see this this title this movie, and uh, of course my mom would never let me watch it. I was at an age where she was like you know don't watch that kind of stuff just because it was Pam Anderson and and everything you know her in the news and all that stuff. So I never saw it, but I can picture the cover. I knew it was her, although I didn't even realize this was a, a comic book uh, thing i wasn't expecting to see this kind of question i don't know if anybody was expecting to see this kind of question uh, and that's what i mean by like these dark horse comics although hellboy is more relevant for today's time uh, barbed wire yeah go back to the early mid 90s um that's quite a pull i would think jay would have known this one but i think there's a lot going on in the studio so everyone's kind of losing their mind when he can't come up with a question and all this stuff is going around and then he's got to kind of contest with that so i think the inexperience this is only his third time at the desk answering any kind of questions in the schmodown so uh yeah he's been in the studio a ton of times but it's different when you're at the desk in the third round and you're playing for a shot to actually win this thing because he had a shot man just super super surprising that uh this, it played out the way it did before reality television turned paris hilton and the kardashians into worldwide celebrities in the 90s, it was really Playboy that would have a few exceptions here and there, like Pam Anderson, like Carmen Electra, like Jenny McCarthy, to where they would cross over into mainstream success and become uber famous to where they could get acting gigs and films. And this is just shocking that he didn't pull this. So well, let's move on to Jay Washington's three-pointer. Again, the category was villains. And once again, John Rocha read the villain question how fitting once again and the question was basically asking who is the character with the real name of george harkness and that's captain boomerang so jay jay washington knows the real name of captain boomerang but not barb wire's actor when pam anderson was at the height of her power in the mid 90s so this is just crazy what people hey, know he and what they don't. he likes Suicide done. Squad, all right? I, I mean, know, he but still. he liked the movie, so he, it was fresh in his mind. It's more recent. Did they say the name George Harkness? I mean, during that montage where they introduce all the characters, like a music video, they must have quickly included George Harkness. But I couldn't remember a moment in that film where George Harkness was significantly pointed out, at least. It must have been said in passing. So, For Suicide Squad, once again, <laughs> kind of saves Jay here in the moment. For being completely embarrassed in the third round here. I have no words. How the hell does he keep getting all these Suicide Squad questions? Uh, and he knows all of them. From what I hear, I've never never even seen the movie. I'll get to it one day. But uh, he wants to love this movie. And hey, you love what you love. And it saved him here for three points. Guys, I just looked it up. The Suicide Squad script never says George Harkness. It says Digger Harkness. So... They refer to him by a different name. So technically, if Jay got it wrong, he could have challenged because the question wasn't entirely correct. Since they never say George Harkness in the film, they say Digger Harkness in the film. So he got it right nonetheless, which shows that he knows Suicide Squad and all of those respective characters. But interesting nonetheless, given that he knew such a deep reference in comparison to Barb Wire. Let's move to Jason Inman's two-pointer, Back to the Future, The School Dance, and Shaman Under the Sea. Once again, the Roca conspiracy comes into play here because I don't think he would have known this had he not been calling this match. And of course, Jason Inman, it took him some time. He had to think about it for a bit, but he did come away with it to get his 16th point of the match, tying Jay. Rachel's in the rear with 15. So obviously the third of the Back to the Future questions here on this schmodown. I think that if Jason Inman didn't get 
enchantment under the sea dance and he maybe called it the fish under the sea dance right. like marty's sister did he he would not be allowed in inner geekdom anymore <laughs> i mean this is just as bad as fruit of the loom i mean you just you get kicked out of the division you stay in singles you call mats you get back in teams because this was a good one but this was a, this was a good question though i mean this is like a nice two-pointer you have to have seen the movie to know it so this isn't you know what is the car that is the time machine this is a you know a movie specific question that you have to have seen the movie once maybe twice to at least know so i thought it was a good two-pointer i'm always glad to see back to the future but hey do we all stand i know i mentioned it earlier but do we all stand in agreement on a Back to the Future category on the wheel, I've been pushing for it for months, man. For months, I'm uh, I'm in between. I'm not completely against it. I'm not completely for. I'm right in the middle. I love Back to the Future. I'm trying to figure out in my own mind if I like it as a separate inner geekdom category or part of a a mixed bag category, as it seems to be here. I want it in standard matches, singles and teams, not just inner geekdom. I think it's that big of a franchise to where it should be on every wheel in any format. Interesting. At the very least, it needs to be an inner geekdom. In teams, I could see it as well. Singles, the, here's my only problem, as much as I love the films, I just wonder if there's enough meat on the bone for it to be in all three divisions and not just, you know, use up every bit of trivia for the films. You know, that's why I sure. think for inner geekdom, you know, that way you can kind of, you know, the run of the questions can be a nice long run and you're not using them all up within the three different divisions. Well, it wouldn't be on the wheel consistently. It would pop up here and there, but it does That's true. It That's does true. deserve to be a category. And there are other trilogies like Indiana Jones, which I don't consider there to be a fourth film, but that, <laughs> that pops up every once in a while in standard play, I believe. So if they can use yeah. that sparingly, they can use Back to the Future sparingly. Now, Frank, let me ask you, Inman had answered Under the Sea. Do you think they would have accepted that? Just under the sea, no, because it's enchantment under the sea. I mean, that's they clearly say that in the movie. Going back to his hesitation, I thought he might have been thinking fish under the sea dance and has a, and had to say to himself, that's not the actual name. It's actually enchantment under the sea. So maybe that's where his hesitation was, just making sure he said the right thing. Well, it's a very tight match. We go back to Rachel Cushing for her two pointer. The city in the earth scenes of Thor, the dark world. So once again, the Dark World rears its ugly head in this match, which clearly Skaliski had Thor on the mind because Ragnarok was coming out at the time. So perhaps he figured these players would be revisiting the Thor franchise in preparation for Ragnarok. And as Koi Jandro proved, he was more concerned with Stranger Things at the time. So that gives you an idea <laughs> of when this was taped. But Rachel Cushing, guys, she pulled that out to get two points, 16 16 to 17. Rachel's got the 17, of course. <laughs> You're the luck of the draw, right? Here's the thing. And I was going to say if I guess this rant, you know, for the end of the match, but I guess this is a better time than any. Rachel Cushing, to me, this might upset some people because she's so fantastic. She's so good. She has a wealth of knowledge about all film, not just an inner geekdom. She knows all kinds of film, and she's been so dominant in the schmodown. It's gotten to a point where she's almost the Buffalo Bills in the sense of you get to the Super Bowl four years in a row, but you can't grab the brass ring and win the thing. And I'm just beginning to get a tad concerned on if she has that put away power. It seems as though every chance that she has to walk off with a walk off homer and win the series at game seven, she comes up short. And I just want to throw it to you guys. Do you think that it's just, it happens to be a, a, the luck of the draw. She's not getting the right question at the right time. Or is it, is there something else going on here? Am I looking too much into it? When this match was finally concluded, I said to myself, she very well might be the Peyton Manning of the Schmodown, where you play so well, you get to the playoffs you get to the big moments, and then you just kind of falter. R really great through the regular season. She can get to the big match, but just comes up short. So, yeah, I'm kind of with you on that Buffalo Bills analogy. It's very uh, it's very disappointing, and I know she's got to be just as disappointed, if not more so. But I think eventually, I have to believe, her time will come in either singles, teams, or inner geekdom, hopefully very soon. I just, I'm going to stick by Rachel. 
uh, until she wins one of these things because I really do believe she's going to. And I think as much as they can say about Jason Inman or whoever, she is the only true, in my eyes, she is the only true triple threat. Not Mike Kalinowski. I mean, he can he can cause problems for people. But I think Rachel, I think she will win one of these uh, in one year eventually to win all three in one year I, I don't i don't know if anybody could ever do that she will do it one way or another and, and sometime uh, hopefully in the near future well i'm gonna save my defense of rachel cushing for when we actually get to the end of the match you guys kind of jumped ahead a little bit after her two-pointer i'm gonna save my response and my defense for at the end of the match so buckle up hold your breath it's coming now let's get to jay washington's five-pointer bill Weasley, played by Donald Gleason. This is some kind of Harry Potter brother category. I don't, I don't know. The redhead kid. What's yeah. his name? Ronald Grant or Rupert Grant? Yep, all those. <laughs> what, what impressed me though is that Christian pronounced Donald Gleason's name correctly, which means he's been listening to this show carefully. I love when Christian corrects his pronunciation based on the shows that I've been putting out there the last 18 months. And he's one of the few that actually uses this resource for what it's meant to be. And I just want to give him credit for Donal Gleason. That's Tonal with a D, as I've said six times now over the course of 18 months on SK+. Plus. So Brad, any thoughts on Jay being eliminated via the Donald Gleason question. Well, you know, being well-versed with the Potter films like I am, I thought I would know this question, and I was drawing up a blank. I had no idea. So, once again, another difficult question for Jay Washington, and I think definitely out of the Harry Potter questions during this match, probably one of, if not the most difficult one. I mean, I go back to, you know, what position was Harry Potter in Quidditch. Everyone knows he's a seeker, everyone except for Brian Davids. But, um, <laughs> I... <laughs> I I thought that uh, I thought Jay Washington, as dominant as Rachel Cushing was, and we'll get to her again, but I thought that Jay Washington really was a standout in this match. And once again, he can go out with his head held high because he played way better than most people thought he would, and he exceeded expectations. And I think that's what makes the mark of a good schmodown player. You could tell he went home, he did his research, he came back swinging after that big win against Robert Meyer Burnett, and he proved that this is his division. Like, he has a good knowledge base for inner geekdom, and I was really impressed with Jay Washington. Well, Brad Gilmore, since you did not know this Harry Potter question, clearly Harry Potter is not a strength of yours. Clearly, you are not a real fan of Hmm. Harry Potter, as some Schmodown fans might suggests of course i'm mocking this mindset that if team action misses an action question they don't deserve to have the team name team action or they don't deserve to be considered fans of the action genre because they don't know everything about the action genre so i think it's ridiculous that fans are expected to know anything and everything when again specificity can undo anyone so let's stop punishing people if they don't know something that they announce to be their presumed strength or strong point. So nonetheless, great match from Jay. Jay earned himself another invite back. I think that's all he wanted was the ability to be invited back to play and not always have to be a manager or a mouthpiece for the Misfits. I still think the Misfits are in deep trouble. I don't see them lasting much longer, but he has proven that he does have a place in inner geekdom. There are categories like Star Wars that are probably still going to haunt him. Hopefully he uh, fixes those those weaknesses in his downtime, and he just might. So let's go to Jason Inman's three-pointer, scores and soundtracks. Everyone expected this to be a miss for Jason Inman. It was the closing credits song for Two Towers, but... Given the fact that I reverse jinxed him earlier this week in our first recap. Scores and soundtracks, Jason Inman. Your oh, three pointer. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Your three pointer. The closing credits song for The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, shares its name with which character? Rachel The Cushing. angry look from Rachel Cushing. Steam coming out of Rachel Cushing's ear. <laughs> Gollum. That Part is three. Correct. This proved that he was going to spectacular, even though the match had yet to be decided. So I can't believe he pulled this. Frank. Were you stunned that he pulled this? Oh, absolutely. Not many people stick around for the credits, <laughs> let alone know the names. 
of song that played during the credits. That's just fantastic. That's an amazing pull. Even though it was just a three-pointer, shoot, you could have gave that to me for five points, and I would have been floored. Major props for pulling this question out, especially when it's a Lord of the Rings question, and you got Rachel sitting right across from you. That can be somewhat intimidating, I would imagine, but he pulled it off right in front of her. I mean, I thought that the audience would just was just going to start a slow clap for him because it was just <laughs> – <laughs> it really was. That was such a great pull. I, I had no idea. I wouldn't even say I'm a fan. I'm a, I, I've watched the films. That's to the extent of my fandom of Lord of the Rings. That was the walk-off home run right there. I mean, that was the go-ahead run that just got him – on the way to spectacular. I, I think that when he got that, there was no stopping him. First off, any time a closing credit song is used for a Schmodown question, that's incredibly hard. Rachel probably thought he wouldn't pull this, but once he shocked the world, you could tell it took the wind out of Rachel's sails despite her respectful applause. So a crushing moment for Rachel, to say the least. But I think the Schmodown gods rewarded Jason with some good karma after his kind gesture toward Emma in Tuesday's post-match interview. So let's get to Rachel's three-pointer. Christian actually mispronounced the villain's last name in the question. It's Heder. He said Heater. And while it wouldn't have made much difference in this case, you never know what can spark a memory in someone's brain. But players out there, remember, you can always challenge a pronunciation in such cases you might not always win but why not try who plays the villainous laurel heater in 2004's catwoman laura flynn boyle <laughs> okay, sharon, sharon stone, stone. Sharon. Yep. sharon stone she couldn't come up with the answer even rachel cushing is human at times and i don't know what i was watching but i was watching something recently that showed a clip from this catwoman movie specifically a clip involving Sharon Stone as the villain of the piece. But that's how I knew it based on something that I watched recently. It may have been a collider piece of content for all I know, but it's such a bummer to miss a question like this, especially when it's for a terrible movie that no one should want to admit to watching, let alone knowing well enough to know who plays the villain. So I felt terrible for Rachel in this moment it's still 19 to 17 jason inman and then rachel cushing's five pointer she's got to get this to keep the match alive in fellowship of the ring what two words did the enemy extract from Gollum? those words were baggins and shire so rachel regains the lead 22 to 19 so there's hope for her as jason inman now has to get his five otherwise rachel gets the win going back to that cat woman just for a sec God, that's just a horrible question to get for a horrible movie. Uh, I've heard of the movie, never seen it, and I would have no clue Sharon Stone would be in that kind of movie. Her five-pointer, though, that's a great five-point question because I think the one word that most people would remember is Shire. Uh, at least for me, for I me. could not— <laughs> Yeah, I could not pull Baggins for the life of me. That just goes to show you how awesome— she is when it comes to Lord of the Rings. And if you want to know just how awesome she is in Lord of the Rings, she is now a perfect 7 for 7 in Lord of the Rings questions in Inner Geekdom. Man, now you just had to hope and wait, if you're a Rachel fan, that Jason would fail on his five-pointer. Brad, since you already talked about the conclusion of Rachel's turn when you made the Buffalo Bills comparison, we'll talk more about that in a second, I want to move ahead to Jason Inman's five-pointer for the win. And guess what? The reverse jinx that I helped Jason earn on top of the karma that he earned via the Fife hug, of course landed him the DCEU. This is the guy that hosts DC All Access. This was Jason Inman's week. Of course, he gets a question in relation to Clark Kent. The five-point question is, Jesus. in Man of Steel, during the vision sequence where Zod is showing Clark his plans for the Earth, Clark is wearing a t-shirt representing what real-world sports team? My home team, the Kansas City Royals. Such a perfect question, such an easy question, considering Jason Inman used to tell people that he was from Smallville. He's from Kansas. He grew up on a farm. He is Clark Kent, in essence. So you can't ask for a easier question, given the circumstances, than what Jason received in this moment. This is just further proof that this was Jason Inman's week. It was Jason Inman's match. 
It was his path to Navarro all along. And in response to the racial cushing of it all, in response to Brad's Buffalo Bills comparison, for the uninitiated, the Buffalo Bills lost four straight Super Bowls from 1990 to 1993. Now, we have to remember that Rachel is still just a rookie, having debuted just eight months ago with Fredo Knapsack's Nerds Watch. Bills quarterback Jim Kelly had been in the league like four years before the Bills reached their first Super Bowl. By comparison, Roca debuted in teams as of 2015, and he lost to JTE and Finstock in the semis of the team tourney that year. In 2016, his rookie season in singles, he lost to Mance to begin his career, then he went on the best run of his life, winning four straight matches before losing to Ellis in the final of the 2016 singles tourney and ending 2016 with a 5-2 and two record thanks to a win against Riley via Spectacular's contender match. Now, overall, Roke is now 2-4 and four in title matches, but he's currently lost three straight title matches in 2017. So for Rachel to be a bona fide triple threat just eight months into her rookie season and coming oh so close to singles, teams, and inner geekdom title shots, this is unprecedented. So I can't go as far as to call her the Buffalo Bills when she hasn't lost four consecutive title matches, something Roka has come close to doing via his current three consecutive title losses in 2017. So, Brad, I realize your comparison wasn't supposed to be taken so literally, but I do want to give you a chance to respond while offering your thoughts on Inman's big win. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that, you know, Rachel Cushing, I think we do forget that she's a rookie. My, my, me, myself, I forget that she's a rookie, and this is her first year in the Schmodown because she's been so dominant and has been right there so many times. And I think that was more my Buffalo Bills analogy was she's right there. Even in her rookie year, she's right there every time. And I'm rooting for her. I think we all love Rachel, and we all want her to be either the ultimate schmodown or to be a champion in the league. And I think that's – I think my fandom of her is just like, oh, come on. You're right there. You're right there. And then you get let down. Trust me. I'm a Houston sports fan. We're not used to winning too much. Don't let this uh, World Series win fool you. We're not w- used to winning a lot of things. So I'm used to rooting for a team or rooting for a player and them coming up short. Not to say they're not a great team. Not to say she's not a great player. We all know she's a fantastic player. And if she's not rookie of the year, I don't know what I'm doing. But uh, <laughs> I was just saying that Rachel Cushing, it just feels like every time she's right there, she just can't, she just can't pull on that brass ring. But I have no doubts. That she will eventually. Let's give Jason Inman credit where credit is due. He won. He will face Navarro for the IGD belt at Spectacular. He's now upset Rachel Cushing just like he did Ben Bateman to qualify for the singles tournament. So once again, when he's not the favorite, he tends to pull it out even though individually he's never won two matches in a row while playing by himself. So the reverse jinx from earlier this week where I mentioned that he's never won two matches in a row individually, that's now over. He can say he's done it. Well, for Jason Inman's final question, this go- this just goes back to what I was saying earlier about certain players and teams get on these special runs of questions, circumstances go their way, and this five-pointer just happened to line up with him perfectly. Uh, being from Kansas and everything that that entails in this question. So just another sign that this was what you could call Schmodown destiny for him to face Hector Navarro in Spectacular. So it's been an amazing run to watch. He's answered in two matches now. He's answered 86% of his questions thrown at him. That's tremendously impressive. Going forward for Rachel, I think we're going to see more of these two go at it, probably in teams as well. Uh, But I would definitely love to see them face off one-on-one in an inner geekdom match, hopefully in the near future. Hopefully for a title, maybe. Rachel Cushing, we all remain hopeful and positive that she will have a strap around her waist someday, brother. It's not going to be this year, but I can almost guarantee it's going to be next year. But Inman, this was Inman's time. Your time is up. His time is now Hector Navarro. Inman is waiting for you. Yeah, Brad, you said it best during our Tuesday recording. You felt that 
uh, he would likely repeat this performance on Friday. And I said, oh, Brad, he's never won two in a row. All these things are working against him based on previous history. And sometimes you just have to ignore history because when it's someone's time, it's their time. You cannot stop destiny from happening. And I dropped that quote earlier from Inman saying that. So he believed it and he carried it out. So let's get to the Emma view. He credits fate. And it looks like Emma feels better that she's lost to the number one contender to face Hector. So she was back in good spirits. And then Jason teased that he would have this amazing entrance for Spectacular. So I have no idea what he's going to do, but it sounds pretty special. I don't know what he plans on doing. I mean, since he believes that he's Mr. Destiny, why mess with what brought you here? Go with the Kansas City Royals t-shirt. If he wants to go big, I hope he temporarily employed Brian Chandler because I think that'd be the way to go if you want to wow everybody with an entrance. Moving to Rachel Cushing, Rachel really struggles under the weight of expectations and being such a fan favorite at this point in her young career. And, you know, she's beating herself up over these near wins. And this is what is going to allow her to become a stronger player in the future. And having these reps under her belt next season and beyond She's going to be a super dangerous player. Now moving to Jay Washington. Jay played the best that he's ever played at any point in the Schmodown. And yet he still kind of did his shtick. He still kind of did his nonsense in the post interview. And I felt that he could have gained some more fan favor. He should have approached this interview differently than the usual shtick that he gives out. Now he's very good at it, but given how he played... I would have approached it differently. That's just me. Brad, any take on Jay's post-interview? I think that Jay conducted this interview or performed in this interview in just the manner that he should have. He's a heel to the core. And you know what? When you lose as a heel, it's not your fault. You know, hey, you got a couple questions that didn't go your way. Maybe, you know, it, it just wasn't your night. But guess what? You can always come back and talk your way back into the building and get the fans ready to see you either lose or win again when you can talk like Jay Washington. So I think, though, after this performance, and we might talk about it here a little bit later, too, is Jay Washington has found his domain and he will continue to perform at a high level in inner geek yeah he's definitely earned himself an invitation back yes he is a heel yes he handled it as heels would i just think there was a more effective way to win over fans than doing what he would normally do had he lost or had he not been playing at all so i don't know exactly what that is i just found his approach to be a poor representation of, of how well he played frank any thoughts on jay's post interview i'm kind of with you on that one brian i thought he might approach his post-match a little more subdued. But if anything, Jay is pretty consistent uh, through and through, whether it's promos or post-match interviews. He's going to be Jay Washington through and through. Uh, so I guess we can appreciate that. He definitely does deserve uh, more shots in, in the inner geekdom. I think he proved a lot of people wrong with his performance in this match, as opposed to what he showed us against Robert Meyer Burnett, where he just squeaked by. So for me, he's just right back at zero. And although I will admit that I do believe he has more upside than I previously thought that he did. To wrap up with Koi, he really struggled with the Thor 1 and 2 questions. He even said, yeah, I was going to rewatch Thor 1 and 2 in preparation for Ragnarok, but I decided to watch Stranger Things instead. So that sums up Koi Jandro's inner geekdom match in a nutshell. He watched Stranger Things instead of preparing for this inner geekdom by watching the Thor franchise films to this point so i hope he's back in some capacity he deserves another shot just because he previously won an event i don't want to completely throw someone away after one bad match but if he disappoints in his next match then we might have a problem but let's not bury the lead i gotta give jason inman tremendous credit because he won a four-way qualifier match to face navarro at spectacular for the belt just like he won the five-way singles qualifier to play JSR in round one, where he took out one of the hottest players in the Schmodown, Ben Bateman, who was the favorite at that time too. So he took out Rachel, he took out Bateman, and now he's advanced up the ladder, showing that he can win back-to-back matches by himself. So I'm going to hold back on the Treckle and Hyde knocks for a little while. So amazing week from Jason Inman. All right, as we wind down, it is time for Who Won the Week? I won. This is the segment where we pick a player or aspect 
of the Schmodown. That was the clear winner of this past week. It doesn't have to be the literal winner of each match. It's just whomever's stock has increased the most. Yes, I'm going to go with the obvious choice in Jason Inman, but it's because of the way he's performed in both matches this week. Combined, he's answered 31 out of 36 questions thrown his way. That's 86% correct. That is absolutely disgusting when you look at everybody else in the league and compare that, that number to everyone else. It's only in line with Hector Navarro, the champ, and Rachel Cushing. So uh, he has been on a tear, and that's the only guy I can see winning the week, but I'd love to hear your other guys' thoughts. For me, you know, the obvious choice would be Inman, so that's why I'm going to go off the beaten path here. I'm going to go with the guy whose stock definitely raised to a much higher level than it was previously. For me, the man who won the week is Jay Washington. Jay Washington came in, no one expected a lot from him in this inner geekdom match, and I think he overperformed and did way better than most people could have even imagined him doing. So for me, Jay Washington's stock rose up. And if you don't like it, there's two things you can do about it. And that's nothing to deal with it. <laughs> Damn it. Spoken like, spoken like a true fan. It's easy to say that Jason Inman won the week since he won back-to-back -back matches for the first time in his individual career. An argument could be made that Jamie in Washington deserves the nod since he played better than even he expected to play, despite one of the silliest misses of all time via barbed wire. But I'm gonna go with Emma Fife. Yes, you heard that right, since she put herself out there, something that isn't easy to do for women in this space. She showed how much she cared about her performance and the vulnerability that comes from being a woman in 2017, as well as in this online space. So Emma Fife won the week, as well as some hearts and minds, as hopefully she can come back from that gray storyline that really cost her some fan favor in the process. So I just shocked the world. Emma Fife won the week. Fife for life. I'm not going to go that far. <laughs> but she won the week. Five for the week. <laughs> well, next week we've got the Wild Berries versus Only Stupid Answers and what I call the Stupidity Bowl. The winner gets the annual crown of Stupidest Schmodown Team. Man, that's going to be a fun one. And then top that, formerly Team IGN, takes on KO and Gertler's DC Movie News. I wonder if Ben Bateman will be there to build his inevitable singles rivalry with Mike K.O. Kalinowski. So Frank, until then, where can people find more of you and your work? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at FrankieJ29. And also, if you stick around long enough on the Schmodown videos, you can see my stat segment after every match. So I hope you guys tune into that. Our newest co-host, Brad Gilmore, where can people find more of you and your work? Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at Brad Gilmore. I'm pretty easy to find on there. You can check out my show, The Brad Gilmore Show. New episodes every week on iTunes. Just had the million-dollar man, Ted DiBiase, on. And make sure you check Reality of Wrestling out on Fight TV every Sunday, streaming 3 p.m. Central Time. You can get episodes on demand whenever you want, absolutely free. That's Reality of Wrestling on Fight TV, F-I-T-E TV. And you guys can follow me, Brian Davids, at BDF331 on Twitter, as well as filmschlubspodcast.com for previous TV film interviews and podcasts. Make sure to follow this show at SD Rundown. Special thanks to Brian Ward once again for helping us rebrand the Rundown's new era. His work is as brilliant as it's ever been. So for Frank Janish and Brad Gilmore, I'm Brian Davids, and this has been Schmodown Rundown number 61.